everybody, this is Kevin. Welcome to another episode of Kevin's Modeling Minute. And yes, I've, I finalized the title of this series on Kevin's Modeling Minute. I know last episode I was kind of hinting at some ideas, but um, I decided just to stick with uh, the Modeling Minute. It seems to work. And that first episode was a little longer than I normally want to do these, maybe between 20 and 30 minutes max. But the first one, I just had a lot to get out there. So they'll get shorter and probably easier to watch as we progress. So uh, the first thing I want to do in this episode is start the fin building of the High Flyer XL. I want to install at least one fin now, and if it has enough time to set while I'm showing you other things, then maybe I can get the second fin glued on during this episode. So let's jump right into it. The first thing I need to do is mark the body tube for where we're going to place the fins. So let me pull the, the, the tube out. You're not supposed to glue the two body tubes together yet. Because that's just going to be long and kind of cumbersome. So we'll just, oops, we're just going to use the uh, the one half of the body tube. Um, another thing, hopefully, I, I shifted my seating arrangement over to the side, so the picture in picture up here isn't so close to chopping off my head. So hopefully that'll improve things. Uh, since the last episode, I did take the fins out to the garage and sand them smooth and round the leading edges. I'm not sure how well you can see the leading edges are rounded. The other thing though I want to point out, which is not really a good thing, but it'll it'll get fixed, is look at the three fins together. Do you notice one of them doing something it really shouldn't do? Yeah, I've got a warp, a pretty bad warp in one of these fins. So what I'm going to do is, yeah, there's a really, man, that's bad. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to glue the first two fins on during the episode. And then what I'll do is spray this down with water to loosen up the fibers in the ball. So then I'm going to sandwich it between two weights and a flat surface and let it dry overnight. And then hopefully by the time she dries, she'll be flat as a board again. So this will be the final fin that I'll, I'll deal with as far as gluing on the body. But we need to prepare the body for the alignment of where to glue these. So what I want to do is take your fin alignment guide that came with the kit. This is actually a, an alignment guide that came in another kit, but it's the same size tube set up for three fins. So simply just wrap the guide around it. Take you a piece of masking tape and just simply seal down the guide. And the other thing we'll do is just take a pencil and just mark where the fin line, uh, the fin lines go, and the launch lug. And it really only requires one line because we're going to use our alignment guide to draw our straight lines, anyways. So just go ahead and make a simple mark. And for the launch lug, I'm going to label it LL. The other ones, the fins, I'm just going to leave them blank. Okay. That's all there is to it. What that does is it gives me a mark every 120 degrees around the circumference of the tube, as well as the launch lug location. Then I'll take my fin, not fin, body tube marking guide, and... I'll just lay it in the guide here and simply line it up with the marks that I made. See if I can do this where the overhead can capture it. Just lay your pencil down so it makes that mark and then just draw your line. That's one. And again, there's going to be four total. Three. And coming up on four. And this pencil mark is going to be covered up with primer. I guess you could erase it if you wanted, but why bother? 
So good. Four good straight lines. This this guide is uh, priceless. All right. So now the easy thing about this particular rocket is the fins butt up right to the bottom edge. So you know I don't have to mark up you know three eighths of an inch or half inch or whatever. They line up right at the bottom of the tube. So it'll be a pretty straightforward process. I'm going to do the first one now, and then I'm going to set it aside, let it dry. Hopefully it'll dry during the duration. Dry enough where I'll be able to rotate it and glue another fin on without it falling off. So that's kind of the goal. And what I like to do is use, I use Tight Bond 2 wood glue. Uh, you can get, I think I got this at Lowe's for a few bucks. Uh, pretty universal, but it's really, really strong. And uh, you know, some people will use epoxy, but this holds up just as well as epoxy in my opinion. So uh, it's a lot cheaper and a lot easier to work with. Uh, one thing I also like to do is I'll run a bead of the glue down the seam or the root of the fin, and I'm just going to touch it on the line, and I'm going to take it off and let it sit for a few seconds to kind of dry and harden. Then I'm going to replace it on the line, and it'll hold a lot stronger. Also, before you do this, make sure you've got some paper towels because it can get messy. So, and this is uh, water cleanup. It says so. You know, you can take water or anything you know pretty moist, and it'll it'll wipe it up. It doesn't uh, stick beyond what it should. So. Um, let's see. Let me find. I want to make sure I don't put it on a launch lug line. So, okay, there's one right there. We'll go with this one right here. Okay, make sure I'm putting the right edge on. Another thing I did too is when I t went outside, I hit all three of these with a sander on all four sides so they were all equal. Then, what I did was I very gently laid each of these pieces in a vise. And what I like to do to get the rounded edges is simply. I don't have a piece here with me, but let's just say this was my uh, sandpaper. I would lay the fin in the vise and then just kind of cup the sandpaper over the edge and just run it up and down that edge with the sandpaper curved, and it'll eventually sand that round shape onto the leading edge. It works really, really well. So let's go ahead and get this first fin started. And it doesn't take much. And then uh, go ahead and use your finger just to make sure you get full coverage. And I've already got a lot of excess, but uh, that's fine. Better to take off than run out and wish you had more glue on it. So, okay, so I'm simply, like I said, I'm going to lay it on the line, remove it and then let it set for a little bit. Okay, there, there it is. Now we're just gonna let that glue harden for about 10, 20 seconds. And what it does is it's creating like a, a, a drying hard yet sticky surface that once these two touch, it's kind of like contact cement. Once you rebond these two halves, that, that adhesion is a lot stronger so it'll set quicker and it'll hold its shape because you don't want this drooping over and falling over on you while it's while it's drying so all right so and i've got this little cradle here that i'm going to hold the the tube in while it dries so okay, i'm going to realign these on the lines now it's critical that you get this straight you know eyeball it down the, the length of the tube because if it's not straight with the line it's going to induce air deflection, which is going to cause a roll or a pitch or a different, you know, type of aerodynamic effect on the flight up. And then, you know, you know, give it a nice little push. And if there's a gap, which there aren't, it's not bad at all, but if there were a gap at all in here, when we apply our fillets later on, the fillet will fill in those gaps. So just hold it up, make sure it's vertical. Okay. 
that looks pretty good. Look at the overhead, make sure we're centered on our line. Okay, which we are. So there we go. I'm just going to let that set right there. And um, let that start to cure on me. The nice thing about it being a, a thicker fin is there's more surface area, so it'll it'll actually hold a lot stronger and straighter than if it were a thin 16th inch or, or something like that. So, and we'll set that aside. All right, now the next thing I want to show you is something that is, I'm going to uh, show this on my next Zephyr video, maybe, maybe not, I'm not sure, but motors i'm definitely going to show the motor but what i have to do to the motor to prepare it for the flight is kind of a unique thing but what i want to do is show you guys the different size motors that i've been running here this is an a83 this is the typical motor that i've been flying in the the viking or the wizard uh, my old alpha 3 was on an a83 the the a's b's and the smaller c's are all basically the same size cardboard tube just with different amounts of propellant, you know, poured in, you can kind of see that's pretty hollow on the bottom of the A. If you get to a B or a C, you're going to see the end of the propellant because it, it'll fill up the whole tube. But the A is pretty much maybe halfway full of propellant. But that's a that's a standard size Estes motor right there. Okay, um, I'll lay this so the vertical camera can see them. Now the high flyer and my second. Uh, Citation Patriot that I plan on building is going to take a, a mid power motor, which is uh, a high C, a D, and even an E. I just want to show you the size difference. This is an E6, I'm sorry, an E12 6. Look at that beast. So compare it to the A83. I mean, we're talking substantial difference here. Okay, so that's the E612. That'll really get this high flyer high. But when you jump into the high power rockets, like the Zephyr, and what I'm going to show you is a small high power motor. I'm going to show you an H219. In fact, I'm going to unwrap it from this cardboard tube that they, they come in. And again, this is this is relatively small in the world of high power rocketry. But this is the motor. This is an Aerotech H219. Look at that beast. You thought that E was big. Look at that. And then compared to the little A. <laughs> We're talking serious, serious power here. And again, this is a small high power motor. So I wanted to show you the differences in sizes. Now, one thing that's unique about these high power rocket motors <clears throat> is the um, the discharge of the the deployment charge for the chute, which is at the end of the, or it would be the considered the forward end of the the motor. So what happens is when the motors burn, you you run an igniter up through the nozzle, and when you electrify that igniter, it it burns and it catches the propellant inside on fire and then it you know shoots the, the thrust downward and it burns through the propellant then at the top of the tube is a little uh, explosion charge that will blow upward into the rocket body which is what pushes the parachute and everything else out of the body tube but between the propellant and that deployment charge there's a stage of delay burn in the middle now that delay burn is there to prevent the chute to deploy as soon as the motor burns out. Because at the speed the rocket's moving, you don't want the parachute to eject immediately. It'll, it'll tear it to shreds. So you want that coasting time built in so it can slow down. Right around apogee is where you ideally want it to deploy the chute at zero miles per hour if possible. So these motors have delays in them. Now in A83, the three indicates the delays in seconds. So you're going to get the initial thrust. It's going to end propulsion and it's going to coast for three seconds as it burns through that delay stage. And then it'll fire the 
ejection charge. Looking at this E motor, it's an E12 6. So that tells me there's a six second delay from the propulsion to the deployment charge, a whole six seconds. Now, these motors, the high power motors, come with a well, this one is a 14 delay motor. That's what the, it's a 219 14. A meaning adjustable. You're like, adjustable? Yeah, you actually have to. Well, you don't have to, but you can adjust these to bring it down from 14. If I launch my rocket with a 14 second delay, it would bury itself in the dirt. And then a couple seconds later, it would pop the chute. So that's obviously way too many seconds of a delay. So what Aerotech does is they sell a little tool. Now I'm going to I'm going to be frank about this tool. I'll give my honest opinion of it. It's a good tool, but I think the company could probably do a little bit better uh, job preparing you and explaining it to you. But the way it works is you get a little body here that's got one end that says 4 second removal and another end that says 8 second removal depending on which side is closest to what you're dealing with, uh, if you want to take off less than four seconds, I guess you put the four second one down. Um, or if you have something that's closer to eight seconds that you want, you're going to take, you know, long story short, it's adjustable. And then once you set that on the cap, then you take this drill bit that's in a little knob, you run it down through, and you set it, for the depth that you need to remove. For every millimeter, I'm sorry, for every 1 32nd of an inch that you remove, you're removing one second from that 14 second delay. So if I were to remove 1 32nd of an inch of the delay charge, I'm gonna take one second off so it'll be a 13 second delay. Now, when I did the calculations for my Zephyr to prepare it for its first flight, Based on this motor and based on the weight of the rocket, I concluded through, uh, there's several programs. I happen to use one called Thrust Curve that'll do the calculations for you. And it tells me that I need a seven second delay on this motor for ejection at Apogee. Again, you want it to eject right at the top of the flight when your rocket comes to a, a standstill. So. I need to take this down from 14 seconds down to seven. So I'm basically cutting it in half. So what I need to do then is, and I'm not gonna do this now because I'm gonna wait to do this on my Zephyr video, but I need to remove seven seconds from the discharge. So what I would do is I would set my seven, I'm sorry, my eight second removal on there but I still, I need to take off a 30 seconds of an inch. I hope I'm explaining this clear enough, but instead of the full eight seconds removal, I need to remove one second, which means I need to create a one thirty second inch gap in between the tool and the drill. Now they give you a washer that's one sixteenth of an inch thick. So this would give you two seconds off, but and that would be fine. I could take it down to six or even eight seconds and it would survive. But if the calculations say seven, I'm going to try to get seven. So what I did was I had to go out and make my own little washer. So I took a piece of uh, one thirty second inch birch plywood and made my own little spacer washer. And I, I sanded it down. To, I mean, I had to, I made it precise so I could, with a cali caliper, I could get an accurate measurement to exactly one thirty second of an inch. So that would just sit right on top of the body there. Then when I run the drill bit down, instead of going the full eight seconds, I'm only removing seven seconds. So, and again, I'm gonna highlight this again in my next Zephyr video. Um, now here's the reason I said I'm a little, not too pleased with the, the company. This motor is a disposable motor system. It's a one-time use. It even says right there, DMS. It's a disposable motor system. And it's adjustable, like I showed you. So I get the kit, and in the instructions, it says you need to calibrate the length of the, the drill bit. And I'll, I'm going to do that in my Zephyr video. So you need to set this on a table, use your body tube, and you need to lay two washers as a, as a gap filler to adjust for the four 
second uh, removal. And it says to get that, you must first of all use the RMS body tube and the washer that came with it for your second washer. Well, the RMS is reloadable motor system because Aerotech also makes reloadable motor tubes. So they're telling you, you buy this for your DMS system, but you don't know until you get the instructions that says, oh, to calibrate this drill bit, you've got to have the body tube from the RMS tool and then use that other washer that came with the RMS along with the washer that came with the DMS tool to give you your two washers to give you that four second calibration gap. I was a little dismayed at that. It's like, really? I Why they couldn't just throw an extra washer in there? But that's okay. I went ahead and uh, made up some washers. In fact, I created an eighth inch washer myself, which is equal to four seconds. So I created my own special calibration four second spacer. So uh, if you got a little creativity and ingenuity and you're willing to, you know, get out of your comfort zone a little bit, make the hobby fun. Make, you know, do doing things on your own is half the fun of the hobby. Um, learning how to do new things, new ways. It's a lot of fun. So that's, that's that. Um, I'm going to check on my fin. How's that coming along? Uh, still straight. Looks good. It's actually feeling rigid already. But, um, I'm in no rush to put the second one on because I can't do the third one until tomorrow anyway, after I get that warp out of it. So, what can you say? Uh, another thing I want to do is I got some questions from my last video that I thought I would answer. And I appreciate all the comments you guys uh, made on my first video. Great feedback, really, really good stuff. Um, one of the questions is uh, about the barrel fish clips, these little guys on my nose cone and shock cord. And the question was, could you use one of these clips to attach the nylon braided shock cord to the Kevlar inside the rocket tube? Uh, you may need to uh, cover the barrel fish clip with tape or something. Um, yeah, and that's that's a great question. And yes, you could. The reason I don't is I really don't plan on removing it that often. And if I ever do, uh, I would just take a knife to it and cut it, cut the knot off. Um, like, like the question says, you may even need to use some heat shrink or something to cover because these metal clips can snag. Anytime you've got, you know, extra items in there, they can snag on other fuel lines and make, make snag on the parachute protector. Um, a number of things that are down in there and I, I just don't I'm not gonna risk doing that but you could do it there's no reason why you couldn't clip it um, I just do a nice clean knot make it a little more um, streamlined less less snagging but yeah I don't see why you couldn't do that now you have to tie a knot I mean how much do these weigh I don't know I've not weighed them but you'll have to tie a knot anyway from the elastic cord onto the clip and then clip it. So you're adding a little extra weight as well. Um, again, how much do these weigh? I don't know, a few grams. But uh, as evidenced in some of my most recent rocket flights, weight does matter. I've had some uh, heavy rockets not get as high as I really would have liked them to. But great question. Um, the altimeters, yes, great question. SS does sell an altimeter, and it's, I think, $39 if you can get it. I know they're out of stock most of the time that I've looked. Uh, I had initially looked at getting one of those, and they were out of stock, so that kind of forced my hand as to looking at other options. Uh, if you remember the first video I had, I showed my Flight Sketch Minis, and I showed the Jolly Logic, which is the brand, Jolly Logic Altimeter 2. Now, just to give you a comparison on price points, the Flight Sketch Minis are $29 each. Um, a lot of the, the reason it's so cheap is it's a very simple design and it's not protected in any outer case. There's not any injection molding around it. It's just the circuitry, the circuit board exposed with all the attachments sticking out. So you, you gotta be very gentle with it. It's very fragile, um, but it is relatively cheap 
29 bucks. And I did it. Actually, right here. I, I'm going to show you. That if you haven't gone to the website to look at them yet, this is just an example of, I don't know how well it comes out. Maybe I'll just use the overhead. But it shows a bar graph of the flight, altitude, and timeline. One other thing that it does is it captures, I guess through the internet, at the moment of that flight, it captures what the current weather is at your location. So it knows exactly, well, here's all the, the weather it gives you. Temperature, humidity, what the cloud cover is, if any, by percentage. The average wind, what the wind gusts are recorded up to, and the wind direction. Uh, that's pretty good. Out of a little postage stamp sized altimeter, you get all that flight data as part of your download. And then the flight data, it captures your apogee, the highest point of your flight. It captures the max, maximum speed that the rocket obtained. It gives you its average descent rate on the way down. You want a really low number on that, on that category. It gives you time to burn out, so basically your propulsion time. Time to apogee, how long it takes you from the, the burn plus the coast to apogee. And then it gives you the, your total flight time. And then it gives you an opportunity to type in a little narrative flight description, like a flight log. And then you can upload photos. And because I video all my launches, I take screenshots of my videos to show the launch and a landing picture of each flight. So that's something I like to do with the Flight Sketch Mini. But for 29 bucks, ugh, it'd be hard to convince me to go buy an Estes $39 one. And by the way, I should point out the Estes altimeters only show... The highest altitude gained. That's it. It shows the highest. It shows what your apogee was, and that's it. Now the Jolly Logic Altimeter Two, it was. I think I paid seventy nine dollars for it. So it's roughly twice the cost of an Estes altimeter, but it gives you a lot of the same stuff that the Flight Sketch Mini does. Um, it doesn't give you the upload ability to you know get the chart and graph and all that, but uh, it gives you. Um, and this, by the way, is a little log sheet that you can download from Apogee Components, but it's the Altimeter 2 data log sheet. So this is all the criteria that the Altimeter 2 logs. It records your Apogee altitude, your top speed, your burn time, your peak acceleration in G-forces, your average acceleration in G-forces, your coast to Apogee time, your Apogee to ejection time, your ejection altitude, your descent speed, and your flight duration. So you get all those variables for $79. And the Flight Sketch Mini, about the same for half the cost of that, le less than half the cost, plus the, the online logbook. Any, I'm sold on the Flight Sketch Minis. I just, I love those little things. I just wish they were a little bit more durable. But what are you going to do? Uh, next question was, does the cloth parachute protector replace the parachute wadding? Great question. It may, but I'm not brave enough to attempt it. Um, what I'm doing now is, instead of using just the paper wadding, I am inserting one sheet of the Estes wadding to act as a barrier to keep the other stuff that I use from falling in around the motor tube. And I'll show you what I'm using now. This is uh, cellulose foam insulation. You can get this stuff at Harbor, uh, Harbor Freight, um, no, Lowe's or Home Depot for 10, 15 bucks for a uh, bale of it, a lifetime supply. And then I just, I bag it up in a Ziploc baggie, take it to the field with me. It's, it doesn't have fiberglass in it, so it's safe to touch. You just reach in and it's, it's just real crummy material. The technical rocketing term for this is dog barf. If you're ever out of the field and you hear people talking about dog barf, they're not being silly. They're actually talking about this stuff. And what it is, is it's it's fire resistant, flame resistant, heat resistant. And so it makes a great substitute for the Estes wadding. Um, but like I said, I like to put at least one square down the tube first, just so this stuff doesn't fall in too deep and around the motor. But then I'll put maybe, you know, a couple inches of this, and I don't jam it in. Uh, in previous flights that you'd see me fly when I was having a lot of parachute ejection problems, I was just taking the, the Estes wadding sheets, 
balling him up and ramming him in like I was loading up a musket for a Revolutionary War fight. I would take a ramrod and just hammer it home, and it was just way too tight. So what I've learned over time is just run one square down to give you that barrier. Drop in a couple inches of this and let it let it settle in nicely and soft. Don't don't jam it in tight. And that's it. Then I lay, run my parachute protector with the parachute kind of cupping over, you know, cupping over the parachute and slide that down on top of the 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 dog barf. And uh, I'm having pretty good luck with that. So that's that's what I'm doing on that front. Uh, when prepping your balsa fins, would it be better to use filler to fill in the wood grain first and then use the sealer to protect it afterwards rather than the other way around? Possibly. Um, there's there's a innumerable amount of ways to do it, and I guess the answer is do whatever you're most comfortable with. I've tried different things. The first rocket I built, I actually had a can of sanding sealer, and I just dipped the whole fin in it. Not realizing by that by getting it that soaking wet with that sealant, I just let it dry, and boy did it get a warp, a horrible warp. Excuse me. So I had to sand it all as smart, much as I could down. Um, in fact, I think I ended up having to scrap that first batch. So then I just tried to do one half at a time, and then it warped even worse. Um, what's worth worked best for me is what was in the Zephyr video. Granted, that was plywood as opposed to balsa. But I didn't do anything other than fine sand it, primer it, and then paint on the watered down wood filler onto the primer. That way when I sanded the wood filler down to the primer, I wasn't actually going into the wood beneath it. That's kind of my goal with the high flyer is to go that route. I'm just, I glued the fin straight on, I'll primer it, and then I'll apply the wood filler on top of the primer to fill in those grains. Um, is that the best way to do it? I don't know. I've, I've tried a myriad ways of, in fact, the first Patriot that you've seen me fly that I showed, um, I paper skinned those fins, which means I actually laid the fin down, took my wood glue, spread it on the the fin and then I laid down a piece of copy paper just regular old paper out of your printer and then cut it out and then when it dried I sanded the edges flush and that created a, a pretty smooth surface to each his own I guess you know try different things see what you like see what you don't like um, I'm, I'm curious to see how and I hope it doesn't absorb too much but how absorbent the balsa wood is going to be on these high flyer, fin, high flyer fins when I spray the primer on. I hope they don't absorb too much. I'm afraid if I just use straight paint, it would absorb really bad, but I'm hoping that the primer will give a good layer. So, um, yeah, let me know what you guys do and what works best for you. I've tried many things. I've gotten frustrated with a lot of things. And, and I'm, just, I'm still relatively new into rocketry after taking a 30 year hiatus. Uh, but a lot of new techniques are out there and I'm learning and I'm trying and I hope you guys can share with me you know, your ideas as well. Another question that came in was basically about my setup here. Uh, how do I suspend my overhead camera? So my overhead camera is actually my cell phone. It's my iPhone. And the camera you're looking at me directly with is my laptop uh, webcam that's built into my computer. But for the overhead... What I did was, did was I went to Hobby Lobby and I bought a desk-mounted magnifying glass. Uh, so, like, if you're on, if you're working on a project and you need to see, you can swing this arm in and use the magnifying glass. Now, the magnifying glass has a plastic body around it, so I drilled a hole into the side, and I went to the dollar store and bought a cheap one-dollar tripod for a cell phone, and I I broke the top part off, and I bolted it into the uh, mount for the fiber, uh, the magnifying glass. So, in fact, if you, forgive me one second, I'll go ahead and lower it and show you. Just, it's gonna affect the overhead, but you see it's just a, a spring arm -driven, driven and I've got down here, I've got my, my phone mounted.
Hope that makes sense. Okay, so that's that's how that setup works. Um, but please give me more uh, give me more feedbacks. Uh, give me more questions, comments, suggestions, advice. That's the one thing I love about this hobby is people are sharing, uh, you know, little tips and tricks. If you remember back in the, uh, they may still do it, but I haven't seen them lately. But back in the old days, you'd buy old model aviation magazines, flying models, RC report, model aviation, like I said. Um, and there was always a section in the back where people would send in their suggestions and some very clever, clever ideas. So that's how we learn. That's how we grow. So let me see how we're doing here. Is it is it strong enough to put another fin on? I think it is. So let me attach one more fin to the high flyer. And I'll probably just do the other one off camera because, you know, you already know what it's going to look like. Should have cleaned this little tip off as soon as I finished the last round of gluing with it. But there. Just wipe your finger off. Sometimes fingers can be the best tool when it comes to building rockets and other models. All right, so we'll just, uh, again, I'm just going to set this on the line momentarily. Lift it off, and there you, you see it on the line there. Just give that a few seconds to dry. It's a shame that that one came out warped, but uh, like I said, by wetting it and letting it soak into the balsa grain and then just sandwiching it between two flat surfaces overnight with a lot of weight, uh, that should straighten it out, assuming it dries while it's clamped in there. All right, let me set this back on. Center line. Okay, see, it's already holding. It, it, it tacks up so quickly and nicely. Slide it back a little bit though to get flush with the back end. You guys can see there too. It's pretty good on the vertical. Now, like I said, it is water soluble. So one thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take a Q-tip because I got a little bit of the glue spread outside. There's, I was going to say, do I even have any Q-tips in here? And, oh, a little bit of water. One second. Whoa, huh. earthquake, and just wipe off that extra. extra glue. And some of that's going to be covered up by the fillet that we create later on anyway, so there we have it. Looks good. So there we got two, two of the three fins on. It'll be nice once we get that third one straight. This one laid up actually a little bit better. There was a little bit of a gap on one side of, the, of that fin, but yeah, it'll be fine. So, all right, we'll set that aside and that's all I've got for now. So hopefully I'll get another video out soon when I can get that third fin glued on. And then uh, I also need to start working on my Zephyr part seven video. Um, I've decided I'm going to use part seven to show the final 
the installation of the parachute, the, the, the motor, uh, how the retainer holds the motor in and the nose cone attachment, just all the little finite little mechanical stuff of the rocket. And of course, then video eight will be the maiden flight. Fingers crossed that it passes my level one certification. So, but I'll talk more about that in video number seven. So with that, guys, I'll let you go. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time on Kevin's Modeling Minute.
What? 